Good morning, dear students of the first year English literature. Today we're going to have a completion of our discussion of Idol's House by Henrik Ebsen. Let's go directly to page number 90. Page 90. Uh, we have some information about uh, Dr. Rank's disease. Let's go to this part in which Nora says, Nora, no, yesterday it was very noticeable, okay, at the bottom uh, of the page. No, yesterday it was very noticeable. I must tell you that. She's talking to Dr. Rank or Mrs. Lind. She's talking to Mrs. Lind about Dr. Rank. He suffers from a very dangerous disease. He has consumption of the spine. It's a disease, consumption of the spine or tuberculosis, which we call in Arabic al-asul, okay? Poor creature. His father was a horrible man who committed all sorts of excesses. Why? Or from how, from whom did he get that kind of disease? Okay, it is through his father. His father was a horrible man who committed all sorts of excesses, all sorts of overindulgences. He did many things bad in the past. And that is why his son was sickly from childhood. And so the Tarang inherited this disease from his father or this disease was caused by his father's excesses okay you understand so the son suffers from the immoral deeds of the father and here we find a link to this uh, theory of literary criticism which we call uh, naturalism in which nature is uh, supposed to have some kind of influence on the social life of people. Naturalism. Read about naturalism in English literature. Then uh, go to page number... Of course, you have to read the entire text at home, but we concentrate on certain parts of the text for some purposes. On page number 97, 97... 97. It is part of the Rising Action course. Uh, Nora here is talking to Helmer because she wants to interfere for the sake of Krugerstedt. She, she speaks on behalf of Krugerstedt. Helmer says at the top part of the page, Nora, you surely don't mean that request you made of me this morning. You want to repeat or say something more of that? Yes, Torvald, I beg you so earnestly. Have you really the courage to open up that question again? That issue again? How dare you? Yes, dear, you must do as I ask. You must. And pay attention to this. You must. Pay attention to the wording she uses. To the diction she uses. Let Krustad, you must let Krustad keep his post in the bank. My, be, my dear Nora, it is his post that I have arranged Mrs. Lind shall have. He was supposed to be fired, and then we will let Mrs. Lind take his place. Yes, you have been awfully kind about that, but you could just as well dismiss some other clerk instead of Krugerstad. This is simply incredible obstinacy. This is simply simply uh, incredible obstinacy. Come on, the word obstinacy means stubbornness, in it. Because you choose to give him a thoughtless promise, a thoughtless promise, a promise that you didn't think of its consequences, that you would speak for him, I am expected to. That isn't the reason, Torval, it is for your own sake. To reappoint, to reinstate this man, Krugerstein of the bank, is something for your own good. This fellow writes in the why, why the superficial or the external ex excuse she uh, says to him. Of course, she doesn't reveal the secret so far, and she uses this instead. This fellow writes in the most scurrilous newspapers, in the most 
crude or vulgar newspapers, which we call in Arabic maybe as Suhuf al-Safrayan. You have told me so yourself. He can do you an unspeakable amount of harm. I am frightened to death of them. Oh, I understand. It is recollections of the past that scare you. Oh, it is recollections of the past. Now he reminds her of the history, of the immoral history of her father. What do you mean? Naturally, you are thinking of your father. Yes, yes, of course. Just recall to remind what these malicious creatures, the people who write in such magazines or newspapers, wrote in the papers about Papa in the past, and how horribly they slandered him, how horribly they defamed him or defamed his reputation. I believe they would have procured his dismissal if the department hadn't sent you ever to inquire into it. And if you hadn't seen or hadn't been so kindly disposed, so kindly inclined or willing to and helpful to him. My little Nora, there is an important difference between your father and me. I am an honest, moral uh, man in this uh, society, in this highly conservative society. Your father's reputation as a public official wasn't above, was not above suspicion. His reputation was questionable at that time, suspicious. Mine is, my reputation is above all suspicion so far, of course. And I hope it will continue to be so, as long as I hold my office, my post, and the bank. You never can tell what mischief these men, these creatures, horrible creatures, he call, she calls, of the newspapers, may contrive the any devise or invent. We ought to be so well off, so snug. The word snug means comfortable or warm and happy here in our peaceful home and have no cares. You and I and children, terrible. That's why I beg you so earnestly. And it's just by interceding for him. To intercede is to plead for someone else's sake. Plead P L E A A D to speak on his behalf, that you make it impossible for me to keep him. It is already known at the bank that I mean to dismiss Cruset. Is it to get about now to change my mind? Can I do that? That the new manager manager has changed his mind at his wife's bidding, based on his wife's urging, pleading, okay, begging. I can't do that, never. Uh, on the opposite page, on the opposite page, page number 100, 100, the midsection of the page, Nora tells Torvald, she is still speaking to him. Uh, and here, for the first time, we find her attacking or assaulting by words, of course, verbally, her husband, Torvald. For the first time, she assaults him verbally with words. Torvald, I don't believe you mean that, don't you? Why not? Because it is such a narrow-minded, a narrow-minded way of looking at things. It's a narrow-minded way of looking at things. She accuses him of narrow-mindedness. Okay? ضيق الأفق What are you saying? Narrow-minded? And so he gets furious. Gets very angry. Narrow-minded? Do you think I am narrow-minded? I think... This is the spot, or this is the part of the story, the plot of this play, in which we have the climax. When she accuses him of narrow-mindedness, because she now is 
you know, uh, breaking his image as a man who is responsible for everything in the house, a man who can do anything, a man who is thoughtful, a man who is intellectually superior than her. She just threatens that post, shakes his trust in himself, narrow-mindedness. Now, just so we can consider this as being maybe uh, the climax, this clash between husband and wife, uh, because it's very important, you know, it is a sign of her beginning a new way of thinking, a new way of having uh, a separate identity that uh, than that from her father her her, uh, her husband now just the opposite and it is exactly for that reason it is the same thing it doesn't matter you say my point of view turn over the page my point of view is narrow-mindedness or narrow-minded so i must be so too narrow-minded still he can believe that she could ever use that word against him. He's sh he shocked indeed. Very well. I must put an end to this. I must put an end to this. He goes to the whole door and calls Helen the maid. Helen, what are you going to do? Looking among his papers, we don't want to what I would tell. Settle it. I'm going to settle that. To in this, in this matter. Look here, he's talking to the maid, Khadima. Take this letter and go downstairs that at once. Find a messenger and tell him to deliver it. Of course, this is the letter of Krugestad's dismissal, which carries the dismissal of Krugestad. And be quick, the address is on it. And here is the money. Very well, sir. She exists with the letter. Putting his papers together now. Then, let's little Miss Abstinent. Little Miss Abstinent. Little Miss Stubborn. Okay. So, her stubbornness or obstinacy. Okay. Flares up. Ignites his anger, his fury. And this leads to the climax. This leads to the real climax in this play. In which he, you know, in which he sends a letter of Krugostad's dismissal to the bank. Call her back, Turbo. There is still time. There is still time. Oh, Turbo, call her back. Do it for my sake, for your own sake, for the children's sake, for this family's sake. Do you hear me, Tobo? Call her back. You don't know what the letter can bring upon us. You don't know what this action may have uh, consequences or bad consequences upon the family. Here, the word us refers to the family. It's too late. Actually, it is. It is too late indeed. So the climax already has happened. Then move to page number 105, 105. We have a conversation between Nora and Dr. Rank. Nora and Dr. Rank. Page number 105, 105. The second line from the top, the second line from the top. At the middle of the second line, the middle of the second line, I shall only make one more examination of myself. Here is a sequel or a completion of this speech or this uh, talking about Dr. Ranks' uh, disease of the spine, consumption of the spine. One more examination of myself, to examine myself. When I have done that, I shall know pretty cert certainly when it will be that the horrors of dissolution, the shadows of death, 
the horrors of dissolution, the shadows of death will begin. There is something I want to tell you. Helmer's refined nature gives him an unconquerable disgust of everything that is ugly. His nature prevents him of having an experience of that regard, seeing me in that situation, in that case, okay, in that uh, state of body. And indeed, this word ugly is an implicit reference to the ugliness of the disease he inherits from his father, the ugliness of Ranks's disease that he inherits from his father, who committed such excesses, life excesses, or overindulgences. And so, Torvald, as a man of the society, okay, may consider this ugly. I won't have him in my sick room. I want nobody beside me when I'm dying. Oh, but Dr. Rank, I won't have him there, not on any account. I bar my door to him. I will close the door. As soon as I am quite better, very important, it's very important. As soon as I am quite certain that the worst has come, that I am in the latest phase of my disease, that death is at the door, I shall send my, you my card. I shall send you, Mrs. Helmer, you, Nora, my card with a black cross on it. A black cross on it. This black cross on his card is a symbol of death as a kind of announcement that Dr. Rank is now dead. And then, or is about to die, and then you will know that the loosesome and the unpleasant and the disgusting, the, the unpleasant end has begun. Death is about to conquer his body. You are quite absurd today, and I wanted you so much to be in really good humor. With death stalking beside me, the word stalk means uh, to follow someone and watch, following and watching. How you could think about that with death behind me, watching, keeping an eye on me? To have to pay this penalty for another man's sin? This is very, very expressive. To have to pay this penalty? I am the one who is supposed to pay the penalty and instead of someone else, and instead of my father, my father caused my own death by his overindulgences or his life excesses. I am an innocent man. I didn't do anything. It is my father's responsibility. How could you think of having me as responsible for someone else's sins? How? I'm an innocent man. This is... Uh, this is something wrong. This is unfair. Is there any just in that and in every single family, in one way or another, some such inexorable retribution, uh, inexorable severe punishment, severe punishment is being exacted, is being demanded by someone who is innocent? Putting her hands over his ears, rubbish, talk, do talk of something cheerful. Oh, it's a mere laughing matter. The whole thing, my poor innocent spine, my spine innocent, has to suffer for my father's youthful amusements, has to pay off the debt, the sins of my father. Sitting at the table on the left, this is Nora. I suppose you mean that he was too partial to... So, uh, stop at this uh, section. Go to page number 110. 110. We are, uh, we are listening to uh, a completion of the conversation taking place between Nora and Dr. Rank. Again, Nora and Dr. Rank. 
uh, they didn't finish off their conversation, but here we have another spot, another dimension, which we should cover. 110, okay? 110. At the midsection of the page, when Nora says, more than anyone else, you have my confidence, Dr. Rank, more than anyone else. Okay? I know you are my, uh, my truest and best friend. And so I will tell you what it is. Well, Dr. Rank, it is something you must help me to prevent. You know how devotedly, how inexpressibly Torvald, deeply Torvald loves me. He would never for a moment hesitate to give his life for me. To give his life for me. This is a kind of irony, situational irony, or what we call dramatic irony, because we as audiences and leaders and readers know that this is not true. This is false. He wouldn't. To give his life for me, because he only cares about himself. He is so selfish, so self, self-absorbed. All he cares about is his own reputation, not his family's, okay, or even Nora's, his own reputation. Learning, leaning toward her rank is leaning to the Arab Minha, leaning toward her, Nora. Do you think he is the only one? Oh, so this is the part of the plot in which he reveals to her that he is so much interested in her that he really loves Nora. Dr. Rank loves Nora. Do you think he is the only one who would give his life for you? Next page. Nora with a slight start, just like that. We get the only one, the only one who would gladly give his life for your sake Nora sadly, is that it? Why is she sad? Because she put her trust in him. She thought that he would be helpful, but now he can't. We're going to know why. Just wait. I was determined you should know it before I went away and before I die. And there will never be a better opportunity than this. You know, now you know it. And now you know, too, that you can't trust me as you would trust no one else. You have my trust, Nora. But Nora rises deliberately and quietly. She goes up. Okay? Let me pass. He makes room for her to pass, but sits still. He sits still. Nora. Helen, she calls for Helen, the maid. Bring in the lamp. He goes over to the stove, and she, she goes over to the stove. Why the stove? The stove is a symbol of passion. The stove is a symbol of passion, of emotion. And this is an intense moment of extreme passion and emotion in which he shows his love to her. Dear Dr. Rank, that was really hard of you, hard of you, and it means very unpleasant. I didn't want to, to hear that. No, but to go and tell me so, there was really no need. What do you mean? Do you know? At this moment, the maid enters with the lamp, puts it down on the table and goes out. Nora, Mrs. Helmer, tell me, why, by the way, why does the maid bring in a lamp? Because the atmosphere at this moment gets darker. Darker because Nora is losing hope of any sign of hope, any glimpse of hope that she could be helped in her fight against Kyrgyzstan. And so the atmosphere gets darker and darker. Okay, with his confession of love. It is supposed to be a confession that would brighten her life or gives her hope, but no, to her, 
this worsens the situation even more. Nora, Mrs. Helmer, tell me, had you any... So the lamp, so the lamp and the stove are symbolically significant. Write this down. The stove is a symbol of in, uh, intense emotions and passion, while the lamp is a symbol of... While the lamp is uh, a symbol of hub that is now seems too far too far Nora Mrs. Helmer tell me had you any idea of this oh how do how do I know whether I had or whether I hadn't I really can't tell you to think you could be so clumsy Dr. Rank we were getting on so nicely why did he do that why did he tell me that well at all events you know now that you can command me body and soul you have command over me body and soul so won't you speak out won't you tell me the truth your secret looking at him after what happened i beg you to let me know what it is i can't tell you now i can't tell you anything now because you know now to her he is a rival to her husband he might use this, her love or his love to her. He might use his love to her or his love to her might drive him to, to say that to, to this letter secret, okay? To say that to her husband so that they can break off or something, okay? He might use his love against her, okay? So it is too late. He, he would be useless to her uh, after that, in such circumstances. Okay, this love confession has ended. Go to page number 115. 115. Here we begin having uh, a falling action. This part of the plot we call falling action. It's a fatal confrontation between Nora and Krustad. One of the most important passages ever in this play. You should read it carefully. Page 115. Krustad threatens Nora once more. And he has even more requests. More requests. More grievous and dangerous requests than before. Page 115, at the bottom part of the page, when Krugstad, at the bottom, says, You know, I suppose that I have got my dismissal. My dismissal. The letter which your husband sent has arrived, and it contains my dismissal. I couldn't prevent it. I couldn't do anything, Mr. Krugstad. I fought as hard as I could on your side, on your, on, on your behalf, but it was no good. My husband wouldn't listen to me. Does your husband love you so little? Then he knows what I can expose you to, and he and yet he ventures. If he really loves you, how could he venture that? Okay. The word venture means take the risk. How could he take the risk? So, in this part, he lets her know that he has received the letter of dismissal. At the bottom part of the same page, the bottom, 116, the final uh, part, Krugerstadt says, Only to see how you were, Mrs. I came to see how you're doing, Mrs. Helmer. I have been thinking about you all died long. Emir Kashir, he thinking to himself and telling her about this state of mind. Oh, Amir Kashir, you say about me or think about me as Amir Kashir, a quail driver. You know, a quail driver is someone, a writer who writes with a quail pen. Alam Risha, Alam Risha, quail driver. We call him uh, feather driver. Feather driver. He 
well, a man like me, he speaks like that. Um, well, a man like me, even he has little, a little of what is called feeling, called feel a little, little, something little of feelings. He has little feelings, you know, show it then. She tells him to show feelings, emotions, passion, human nature. Think of my little children. Have you and your husband thought of mine? Have you considered my own situation, my own children? Have you thought of my children, you and your husband? But never mind about that. I only wanted to tell you that you needn't take this matter too seriously. In the first place, there will be no accusation made on my part. I will know I will not do anything. Don't be afraid. Of course, he wants something more. And so he is not going to show this in public because he has he has changed plans. He had he has other purposes. The whole thing can be arranged amicably. It means friendly, amicably. There is no reason why anyone should know anything about it. It will remain a secret. It's okay. It will remain a secret between us three. That you buried money from me and that you forged your father's signature. It will remain a secret. It's okay. But for even a greater price. My husband must never get to know anything about it. How you will or how will you be about able to prevent it? Am I might understand that you can't pay the balance that's owing. Can you pay off the debt? No, not just at the present. Or perhaps that you have some expedient, some other resource, okay? Some other resource for raising the money soon. Do you have someone else who can pay off the debt instead of you? No expedient that I mean to make use of. Next page. Well, in any case, it would have been of no use to you now. It would have, this is very important, it would have been of no use to you now. It, it means, this pronoun refers to paying off the debt. Paying off the debt would be of no use. It is now useless. Paying off, I don't want you to pay off the debt. The debt. Why? As I said, he has other objectives. If you stood there with ever so much money in your hand, I would never part with your hand, uh, with your bond. I would never part with your bond. I will never relinquish the bond. I will never hand it over to you. Tell me what purpose you mean to put it to. I shall only preserve it. I shall preserve it. Keep it in my position. No one who is not concerned in the matter shall have the slightest hint of it. I will not tell anybody. So that if the thought of it has driven you to any desperate resolution, if you just think about anything that would ruin my reputation or that would uh, cause me to lose uh, my post or damage my future, it has. Oh. If the thought of it has driven you to any desperate resolution, of course, this desperate resolution, قرار, يعني, بائس أو قائم على حالة من انعدام الأمل. Okay, it has. So it has. It means that she has made up her mind on leaving. She has reached that desperate resolution. If you had it in your mind to run away from your home, indeed she had. Okay? And she says, I had. I thought of that. Or even something worse. How could you know that? Give up the idea. How do you know? I have thought of that. Most of us think of that at first. I did too in the past. But I hadn't the courage. I hadn't the courage to just run away, to leave. Nora will have the courage at the end. Nor, no more had I. At meantime, she doesn't have the carriage. Later on, she's going to have the carriage. In a tone of relief. No, that's it, isn't it? You haven't the carriage either. No, I haven't, I haven't. Besides, it would have a great, 
it would have been a great piece of folly. It refers to running away. Okay, this desperate resolution, running away, would have been a great piece of folly, stupidity, piece of stupidity. If you do that, you're going to be stupid. Once the first storm of at home is over, once the first secret is known, the storm, which is that she borrowed money. I have a letter for your husband in my pocket. I have a letter, the second letter. Okay, and both letters, the first one from her husband to Kyrgyzstan and the second one from Kyrgyzstan to her husband, both letters are threats to Nora's, to Nora's life, socio-moral life, threats. I have a letter for your husband in my pocket, telling him everything in the letter in as lenient a manner as I possibly could, as permissive or tolerant manner. He mustn't get that letter. Tear it up. I will find some means of getting money. Excuse me, Mrs. Helmer, but I think I told you just now. Of course, a moment before, he told her that he is not keen on the money. No more. He doesn't want the money. Okay? It is useless now because he, other, he has other intentions. I am not speaking of what I owe you. Tell me what sum you are asking my husband for, and I will get the money. I'm not asking your husband for a penny. No, I don't want any money. So what? What do you mean then? I will tell you. Look at this. It's very, very extremely important. Page, at the, the same page, going on. 119, the final line. I want to rehabilitate myself. This word rehabilitate, it means restore his good reputation, restore his good reputation. He wants to clear and clean his name. He wants to clear and clean his name, restore his good reputation, Ms. Helmer. I want to get on. This is the second even greater purpose objective. I want to get on. I want to get on with my life. And in that, your husband must help me. Zay, how? How would he do that? How would he help him rehabilitate? Clear his name. How? For the last year and a half, I haven't had a hand in anything dishonorable. I didn't do anything wrong in the past one year and a half. And all that time, I have been struggling most restricted circumstances. I suffered so much. It means he suffered so much. I was content to work my way up to step, my way up step by step. To work someone's up step by step, it means to start new, to start a new life, a new style of life. Now I am turned out and I am now going to be satisfied with merely being taken into a fever again, to have people's pity. I want to get on, I tell you. Look. I want to get into the bank again. He wants to be repositioned in the bank, reinstated in the bank, but not only this. In a higher position, in a higher position or post, عايز يرتقي even, okay? عايز يرتقي في المنصب أعلى من كده. يأخذ منصب أعلى. Your husband must Make a place for me at the bank, even higher, greater in position. That he will never do. He will. I know him. He daren't protest. And as soon as I am in here or in there again with him, then you will see. When I get in the bank once more, within a year, I shall be the manager's right hand. Right hand. I shall be the manager's right hand. It will be Nels Krugerstad. It will be all about me and not Torvald Helmer. I will even take your husband's post at the bank. Who at the bank? That a thing you will never see. Do you mean that you will, that you will run away? I have carriage enough for it now. Oh. Before that, a couple of pages before, Okay, 
she told him that she wouldn't, she hadn't uh, the carriage to do that. And she wouldn't have the carriage. But when he threatens, when he threatens Helmer, she begins having the carriage. I have carriage to do it now. Oh, you can't frighten me if fine, someone fine like you, spoiled lady like you. The word spoiled means, spoiled, S-P-O-I-L-T. It means overindulged or pampered. Overindulged or pampered. مدلل مدلل زوجة مدللة زي كده تقدر تعمل كده سيب البيت وتمشي. She would she leave the house? Is poet lady like you would do that? You will see. You will see. Uh, on the same page, one hundred twenty one, one hundred twenty one. The middle of the page, Krigstad says, "Have you forgot that it is I?" Who have the keeping of your reputation? Oh, it's a direct, it's a direct threat. Nor stands speechlessly looking at him. Well, now I have warned you. Don't do anything foolish. When Helmer has had my letter, I shall expect a message from him. And be sure you remember that it is your husband himself who has forced me into such ways as this again. Okay. He's going to have responsibility for all that, that might happen in the future, in the near future. I will never forgive him for that. Goodbye, Mrs. Helmer. Look how Nora feels now. She goes to the hall door, opens it slightly, slightly, and listens. She is so afraid that he might commit what he threatened, that he might do what he threatened. That he will post the letter in the mailbox to Helmer. She's speaking to herself. Look how how much psychological burden she carries. He's going. He's not putting the letter in the box. And then she stops. Oh no, no, that's impossible. Why? What is impossible? She opens the door by degrees and by degrees, step, or letter by little. She opens the door. What is that? She is speaking or talking to herself. What is that? He is standing outside. He is not going down the stairs. She is describing the situation of the scene to you. Is he hesitating to post the letter? Is he hesitating? Can he? At this moment, a letter drops into the box. He did that. He dropped the letter into the box. Then Kruger's steps, steps are heard tell the die away as he goes down the stairs and then he leaves. Nora utters a stifled cry. She utters a restricted or a restrained cry. يعني صرخت ولكن صرخة مكتومة غير مسموعة. I run across the room to the table by the sofa. A short pause. Of course, she wouldn't believe that. But actually, she, she saw it happening. And the letter box steers across the whole, to the whole room. There it is. There it lies. Terrible, terrible. There is no hope for us now. There is no hope. All seems hopeless now. All hope is gone now. Turn over the page. Uh, at this moment, or a short while after, Mrs. Lind comes uh, to, to see Nora to test the, uh, the dress of the festive party. On page number 123, page 100. 123, the first line of the page, 123, 1, 2, 3. That letter is from Krugestad. Here we find Nora admitting the, the truth to Lent. This is part of the falling action of the plot. Okay. 
which begins with Crooked Stats coming again and threatening Nora for a second time and having even greater uh, or maybe uh, dangerous propositions or objectives in other requests or even worse. And then she confesses the fact or the trust to her friend, Mrs. Lind. That letter is from Krugerstad. Nora, it was Krugerstad who lent you the money? Was he who lent you the money? Yes, and now Tovo will know all about it. Believe Nora, that is the best thing for both of you. And she was right in this, by the way. She is right. Because it will be best for her when she runs away for her own sake, for the, same, for the first time, she's going to do something positive in her life, not be submissive to her husband anymore. And here's something good as well for the sake of the children. No, you, you don't know all. I forged a name. I forged a name. That she burns money, some money from Grustad, this immortal person, and then that she even forged a name, her father's name, to immoral and uh, socially unwelcome crimes. Uh, on the same page, one, two, three, at the bottom, Nora says, and if it should happen that there were someone who wanted to take all the responsibility, all the blame, you understand. Still, even after all that horrible horrible life she had so far from the moment she borrowed money from Kruger's dad and sacrificed her entire life to the service of her husband and sons or children. She doesn't quit that. She wants to commit even more sacrifices for the sake of her family. And so she wants to take all the responsibility, all the blame. Yes, yes, but how can you suppose then you must be my witness. That is not that it is not true. Christian, I am not out of my mind at all. I am in my right senses now. Now. And I tell you, no one else, she means her husband, has known anything about it. I and I alone did the whole thing. Tell the society, tell the police, tell the society, Tell my children that Torvald is innocent. He wasn't part of that all. I was the responsible one for that. I shall take the blame alone. I did the whole thing, remember that. I will indeed, but I don't understand all this. How should you understand it? And underline this, very important. A wonderful thing is going to happen a wonderful thing is going to happen so she begins to have a kind of an enlightenment a self-enlightenment a spiritual and internal enlightenment that the actions she's going to commit at the end of this play at the end of this part of her life uh, is is going to be great wonderful her leaving away her leaving the house her liberty, the wonderful thing that's going to happen indeed is her liberty, her freedom. A wonderful thing, yes, a wonderful thing, but it is so terrible. Terrible in consequences. Christian, it mustn't happen, for not for all the world. It, I will go at once and see Krugerstad. So, Mrs. Lynn decides, and this is very important because she's going to do something. She's going to speak to Krugerstad. Don't go to him. He will do you some harm. But no. There was a time when he, when Christad, would gladly do anything for my sake. So this is revelation of the love he had for Mrs. Lynde in the past. And so she's going to use her powers over him for Nora's sake. To help Nora out of this. But unfortunately, it's going to be so late. Thank you, dear students, and I'm going to see you so soon, inshallah.